Again, my name is Mitch Brooks. This is Morning Coffee on RVN TV. My co-host this morning, Chris Smolda, and our guest, Tara Hopko. Uh, Tara has a very, very important story. I know a little bit about it. Krista has uh, met with her and interviewed her before, so I'm, I'm going to kind of turn it over at this point. But forgive me if I ask questions along the way. I just think this is a very important story that needs to get out. So. Well, and it's not the kind of thing that you can say it. There's not enough times you can say it. You can say it a million times, and that's still not enough. So after I interviewed with you, I felt very compelled to share it with everyone that I knew that had had, you know, uh, breast implants or, or was feeling a certain way. And, I, and anytime someone told me they were sick, I would the first thing I would say is, "Do you have implants?" You know. Yes. So, and I've texted you a couple times and said, "Is this she okay?" Me that one is day. this? <laughs> kind of, is you this said no, good? right? I said okay, no. Good. <laughs> exactly. So, I would like to start with you again, and you told it a thousand times, but like I said, please tell, tell, us, tell the story. us the story. Sure. Thank you for having me, first of all. It's good to be back. And, um, and Chris, I, I appreciate so much you helping me spread the word. That That's means right. a lot to me. So uh, 2015, I you know, was a working mom, and, and I just decided that getting breast implants was going to be something that was going to make me feel better. Um, I had done bodybuilding for a couple of years, and I felt as though you know, breasts were going to make me feel more like a woman. Mm -hmm. And so my husband and I discussed it. It was something that we you know, researched in great length, we thought at the time, and we went ahead and did it. I found now a this, surgeon. This is, you said 2015, so this is significantly after the initial wave of people who had the silicone implants that leaked and all the problems that came from that. Yeah, and after they put them back on the market right. and in early 2000s. So you would think that the work has been done, now they're safe, yes. which I gather is not the case. Yes, the narrative that they use is that they were the safer ones. They use the term gummy bear implants. They make them sound cute and uh, harmless, right? Yeah, so uh, really. everybody loves a gummy bear. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know, we felt that they were safe. And we looked at, you know, the, the brand and the doctor and we thought we got, you know, everything just right. So I had gotten silicone textured uh, implants. And uh, again, I said it was 2015, it was April of 2015. And I noticed initially that I was having trouble kind of coming out of the anesthesia. I was feeling a little um, fatigued you could say, and I thought it was just anesthesia. So uh, I kept plugging along and... Um, this is post-surgery. This obviously. is post-surgery. How, how, how long post-surgery? You know, a couple of weeks. Really? I kept saying to myself, oh, it must just be the anesthesia, it must just be the anesthesia. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was, it was weird symptoms like frequent urination, um, again, the, the fatigue, acne began to start in my face. And so I just um, attributed a lot of it to the bodybuilding that I had done. I right. thought, well, I messed up my adrenal glands and, you know, I must be, you know, just have beat up my body pretty well. So I was justifying it all and um, I didn't ever attribute it to my implants. So I would say things started to get real bad about year one, um, you know, full year after I had the implants. I enjoyed them for a little while as best I could. Um, but actually right away in the, uh, the first few months of getting them, I had um, lymph nodes that were swollen in my armpits. So my surgeon kept an eye on me. Right. He'd have me come back every three months and he'd check them. And I remember asking him, why are my lymph nodes swollen? And he said, well, you know, your body's adjusting to the foreign object that you've just placed inside yourself. And I thought- Which sounds logical. It does, but no one had ever said foreign object before. It was always safe lifetime devices, right, right, right. you know? So I thought, well, I never looked at it that way. What have, I, what have I put inside myself, you know? So I tried to enjoy them as much as I could. Um, so I would say by year two, I was really unable to do a full week of work I was that fatigued. I'd come home and just sit on the couch. I'd fall asleep pretty early. My kids would have to wake me and say, Mom, it's bedtime. You know, my husband worked nights. So it was just me and the girls a lot. And I just want to interrupt you. This is a person that prior to was extremely energetic, <laughs> was healthy, was in fitness competitions. Well, I was going to say, I mean, a bodybuilder, obviously. Yeah. You have to have a lot of energy sure. and yes. know what the right things are to put in your body. Right. And so it's not like you were sickly or a tired person before. Correct. I had gone from person. doing three hours at the gym a day to driving past and going, oh, I, I can't even stop. I'm so tired. It was just a, it was a chronic fatigue like you can't even explain. And Girls and that they, have suffered. They looked at the, the traditional 
suspects, Epstein Barr, and you know, all those types of things. I had gone for blood work, I had seen an endocrinologist, I had seen a dermatologist, you know, in those initial months and, and first two years sure. I had seen, you know, my primary doctor and And most of the ologists that were out there. Oh most of, yes, by the end I had seen every ologist I think that there was pretty much. No and one said to you anything no. about implants. No. Not once did anybody ever ask me if I had them. And some of the doctors, I would assume, knew. We have a picture up on the screen of what your face got to yes. from an acne perspective. So the acne was my worst symptom. It had gotten so bad that at night I would sit with ice packs on my face. Um, it burned, it itched, and it hurt so bad that it hurt to smile, it hurt to eat. Um, and I didn't want to leave the house, quite honestly. You Did know. they want to do something like, I don't know if you were on or if they proposed Accutane as, as one of the I treatments? I had tried Accutane. I had gotten through two pills and I felt as though my brain was swelling to the point where it was going to come out of my ears. Um, my husband looked at the pamphlet that comes with it and he said, it says that there's um, intracranial pressure is one of the severe side effects. I think you should stop taking this. So I had tried all sorts of oral antibiotics. Okay. Um, topical creams, creams topical, everything. Yeah. I felt like I had tried everything and it would work, sometimes it would work for a little bit, but it really just, you know, never, it never did. So um, the acne was definitely my worst symptom. The anxiety, the depression, I wasn't sure if it came from the acne, you know, right. like which came right. first, but um, it got to the point where I'd be woken in the night with panic attacks, so I knew it wasn't just the acne that right. was causing uh, the anxiety. Um, I began with heart palpitations, so I had gone to a cardiologist and I had a stress test done and all of that. I had begun with a lot of GI symptoms. My stomach was just never right. I had a lot of food sensitivities that I had never had before. I was able to eat pretty much whatever I wanted and then I couldn't. And um, the other issue was a lot of issues within my throat area, so um, silent reflux I had. I felt like I had swelling here in my arteries, so I had done tests on my carotid arteries. I had a CT scan of my neck, and you know, it was just, I, I would joke with my primary care doctor, and I'd say, I, I just have a weekly standing appointment here, so, you know, like, what is it this week? And I felt like I was 80 years old, you know? I had friends at work who would say, I feel like I'm sitting next to an 80-year-old here, and it was funny, but it wasn't funny, no. and I felt like I was dying of something. Mm -hmm. So I would cry to my husband every night and I'd say, I'm dying and I don't know what it's from. I don't know what's wrong with me, but I talked to him about my wishes for when I was gone. And that was one of the worst times in my life because, you know, it's one thing if you do have an illness and you do have a disease and you know what it is and you're, but when you don't know, I feel like sometimes that's the worst it's part. It's out of control. Mm -hmm. It's a very out of control feeling. So. Um, it came to a head Christmas of 2017. I ended up on Christmas Day in the hospital. So I woke up that morning and I couldn't walk. Um, I had such severe pain in my hip that I couldn't walk, I couldn't sit, I couldn't stand. I was just in pain. So I begged my husband to take me to the hospital, which he did, and my mom watched the kids. And it was inconclusive. They did an x-ray and they said, we don't know what's wrong, you need to see an orthopedist. So I did, and they did an MRI. And he gave me some anti-inflammatories and he says, you have spontaneous tears in your tendon. He said, are you sure you didn't fall down the stairs or have an accident? I said, no, I just woke up this way. He's like, well, okay, take these anti-inflammatories. So I did. And not only did that clear up the pain in my hip, but it cleared up my acne. And it made me start to think, well, what the heck? So I started looking up autoimmune disease and acne related to inflammation. And once I entered in, um, our breast implants, do breast implants cause autoimmune illness? I found A world of the website that saved my life, which was healingbreastimplantillness.com. And it was started by a woman named Nicole, and she suffered from breast implant illness herself, and she started the website, and she now runs a support group, which when I joined back then in 2017, there was 36,000 women. Mm -hmm. When I spoke with Crystal last time, there was 56,000 women, and today there are 76,000 women in this group. That there are women suffering everywhere, and we are left to our own accord to figure out what's wrong with us. So we search the internet, we do everything that we possibly can, and we find this website, and it literally saves your life. So, go ahead. I, I was gonna say, so my question is, 
Obviously, you were able to localize and you know that it was the implant, but does anybody have any idea what it is about the implant that triggered? Is it just the fact that it's a foreign object in your body and it triggers this immune reaction? So it's twofold, I believe. It's, yes, I believe that it's um, the foreign object. So when you place an implant inside your body, your body creates a capsule around mm -hmm. it, and that's your body's way of protecting you from this foreign object. And that immune response, I believe, keeps your body almost in overdrive all the time. Because it's only, trying to fight it. Correct. And the only way I could explain how I felt was I felt that I was always in flight, fight or flight mode. You know, I was either a ball of nerves or I was depressed and, and anxious. It was just this really inner turmoil feeling right. all the time. So I believe that it's that autoimmune response, but I also believe that um, silicone and saline implants are made of, I think, 40 chemicals on the outside shell alone. And so what happens is over time, you put that inside a body that's you know, over 98 degrees sometimes. And, it's and it's right. And so it starts to leach into your bloodstream and those toxins mm -hmm. begin to slowly wreak havoc on every system in your body, your adrenals and your every edges, every system. So um, I believe that that's where that illness comes from. And, and there's women who've got full blown autoimmune diseases. There's women who have um, lung issues because, you know, you've placed these foreign objects right over all of your major organs. Yeah. So, you know, we I know there's a woman in um, heart failure. She's got heart failure. There's another one who's had chronic lung disease. And some of these things have cleared after taking their implants well, out. The next question, if you yes. remove the implants, does it go away, or in how many cases does it go away? In many Forget cases, no, no, it's okay. Um, in many cases, it does go away. They've got blood work that changes. We have a young lady whose thyroid numbers completely changed, um, and so you're seeing, you know, they're, they're, the FDA and and um, you know the medical field is saying, well, where's your proof? Well, we are the proof. Yes. We are the proof yeah. because I didn't change anything, and you saw that photo. I changed nothing right. about what I had done on my face or to my body, and yet I feel and I look so different. So we have to be the proof, and they have to start yes. listening to us eventually. Are you getting any positive reinforcement from the medical profession, from some of the practitioners and some of the ologies? <laughs> yeah, I would say that we're starting to, for sure. There are several surgeons now that are very trusted within our community to perform the proper explant procedures. Right. Um, because the important thing is not just to take the implant out, the important yeah. thing is to take that capsule out. Right. Because a lot of surgeons, it's easier to leave it in, it's yes. an easier surgery for us to recover from and for them to perform. So are there, are there doctors out there and surgeons that are removing the implant and not the capsule. Correct, yes. Okay. And they'll tell the woman, your body will absorb it. And it's untrue. It's completely false. And you should see pictures of these capsules when they come out. Do you have a picture? I Did didn't send, okay, I didn't send okay, a picture this time. That one you want to show. <laughs> well, no, you, I mean, she's blasting it all out there. And it's, it's no, I understand. Yeah, you can absolutely find me yeah. on Facebook and Instagram. And I put everything out there because I believe that people need to see the, the not beautiful side. Yeah. You know, my breasts were beautiful. My implants came out perfectly intact, and yet they tried to kill me. Yes. So they don't have to be ruptured, and they don't have to be disgusting to make you ill. That's the thing. Yeah, I remember that was really the big issue during the first go-round. Right. Where it was the, the, the rupture and the silicone leakage, and really that was the issue. Everybody was going on the idea that it was the leakage that was the problem. Right. And what you're finding now is that's really not the case. It's just the whole idea of a foreign object in the body. Correct. It doesn't I would think you would be getting a lot of support from the rheumatology field. You know, we're really trying, you know, there's a lot of women just like me who are trying to get the word out there and trying to, you know, we're all trying to educate our own physicians. Right. You know, I'm in the process of creating like a little bit of a, a slideshow for my physicians and just to say, hey, listen, this is what I went through. You've seen me heal. Now you need to start asking the questions. You put it, you know, you, you fill out a medical history form. Do you have, Do you have breast implants? <laughs> Why can't you, just a simple question, and then you know you can educate them. So I think it's partially educating the doctors as well, and there's always gonna be some that are open to the information and some that are not. Educating the doctors. I just think that is such an interesting phrase that just we, right, are, are educating physicians. It scares me. Yeah, I mean, you know, the physicians, they all took the same oath, right, to do no harm to their patients. And if they truly meant that, 
then they'll listen to us. Yes. Because like I said, we're the proof. So, um, so you're gonna have ones that listen and you're gonna have ones that don't. But I can guarantee you, none of us are gonna shut up about it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is gonna be, it's been prominent in the news and it's just gonna continue to be prominent out there. So, so said, this, is, this is really very important information that, that I'm glad you're here Thank that you. we're helping to get out because. And, you, go ahead, I'm no, sorry. I, I can relate, my wife is, is a, a DES daughter. Um, and you would have to be a, really a baby boomer to understand what that is, but it's basically a drug that was given to women to theoretically prevent miscarriages. Okay. The army was giving it to women and not telling them it was a drug. They were telling them it was a, a prenatal vitamin. Oh. Um, all of the, the all the medical studies for this drug were flawed. Right. So there's a whole body of law around this, and, and you guys are kind of you guys forgive me. You're you're you're, you're you girls. Yeah. <laughs> I, you're in a similar situation where you've got to educate the doctors because. Yes. We're the first generation, and every time she goes through another life stage, it's a question of how this is going to affect affects her. her. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you're in a similar situation. Absolutely. So. And there was so, so so there's a picture on the screen. Um, yes. So um, textured implants are also known to cause cancer, and you know the FDA just released a statement that all implants will cause cancer, but it is definitely linked to these textured implants. So the website that you see on the screen there is um, breast implant associated anaplastic large cell lymphoma. So what happens is, again, that autoimmune response sets your body into that overdrive and it can create a lymphoma within you. And so it's not a breast cancer, it's a cancer of the immune system. And there are several um, signs, you know, uh, first of all, if you have textured implants, you should definitely. Can, can I stop you for a second? Mm -hmm. What is a textured implant? Okay, so you have smooth and you have textured. I, I figured that out. Yep. But so what, you what have, it's just the surface, the, out, the outer surface of it. So and the reason for going one versus the other? All right, so the textured implant is going to stay in place better. This is what they sell you yeah. on that, you know. Um, that the texture actually kind of keeps it in place in the body correct. because of the. Friction. Correct. Okay. I was told that I was so little that, you know, I didn't want my implant to end up in my armpit. So I was going to, you know, the textured would be great for okay. me. Um, and so I had gotten the textured implants. The smooth implants, you know, they don't create as great of an immune response or maybe not as quickly. And we're thinking that that's why it's associated more so with the textured implants. Um, and your body just really adheres to that texturing. Right. The sad, sad thing is that many women who have had double mastectomies receive these textured implants because they don't have breast tissue to hold their implant in place. So now you've got women who have fought breast cancer who are now fighting lymphoma from their implants. Now right now, as far as I believe March, was 688 cases worldwide. 270 of them were in, in um, the United States, and I believe there are nine reported deaths. Now I say reported deaths because I believe that there happen. are so many more out there. Sure. Oh, yeah. Because before we knew all of this, how many women have died? I alone have sat at work with a friend, and she told me her sister suffered from breast cancer, had reconstruction, was never the same afterwards, and died of lymphoma. She, the first time she had ever heard of this cancer was when I talked about it at the lunch table. And it breaks my heart because there's so many other women I think that we've lost and we don't realize it. Mm -hmm. And so I just feel that it's so important to educate women on these dangers. I was Gosh. never told and I specifically went to several doctors prior to getting my implants yes. mm -hmm. and I said, can these cause me any kind of cancer and will they make me sick? And I was told, no, they're perfectly safe. Everybody does this. And, you know, anytime you go to get something like this, you're given a sheet to sign. Yeah, well, right? it's informed and, consent, and it's but, how, how well informed Tara are you really? Tara was the one that actually read it. <laughs> no, because a lot of us don't read it, you know, don't read all of it because it's the 1% or it's the whatever percent. But when I left you, when I interviewed you last, you had a mission and a goal yes. to get that piece of paper to have something added to it that says breath implant illness. You know, and, and, and about it. Yeah, so and you what can we read have it and learned, maybe change your mind. Right, absolutely. And what we have learned is that the manufacturers put this information in their booklet. However, they send a box of implants to a surgeon and only a couple of brochures with a recommendation. You should give this to them. I didn't get Our one. Mandate. I, right, it's not mandatory. Recommendation. And it's a recommendation. And so I didn't get that. And a lot of women that I know, we didn't see it, and, but it says it in there. The and manufacturer stated. And then we go back to that issue it. that I brought up of informed consent. How many Correct. people really are going to go through all the details and 
you know, and, and understand that, yeah, there is this risk that's out there. And yeah, it may only be a couple percent, but you do need to be aware of it. Because mm -hmm. uh, we just tend not to be that way. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately, we have a very short attention span as people. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of cases, we'll just take the quickest route to the end that, we, that we're seeking. And, and unfortunately, here's one of those cases. So reconstructive surgeons who should know better, yeah. Yeah. I would think is one of your main group that you're focused on as well. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Breast surgeons, um, oncology, you know, that is definitely an area. It's not necessarily an area that I'm diving into just yet, um, but there are many women. There are, there's so many women in the advocacy group, as well as the BIA ALCL, which is that cancer. We have a, a group just specifically right. designed for women who need to get proper testing, because that's the other thing. These doctors don't know how to test the women, um, you know, because some of the symptoms are swelling in the breast, you know, and it's, it's an onset like a year after your implant you know we're talking two three years after women get their implants they have a sudden swelling on one side and then it might go away so they think oh okay maybe I just hit myself or I right, bumped right. into something right that is one of the symptoms um, swollen lymph nodes is another symptom and um, fever and night sweats things like that those are some of the other symptoms so there's certain things that you need to look out for and then there's certain ways to test correctly which is draining the fluid testing the fluid and sometimes even if the fluid turns negative, you have to then explant and test the capsule. So these women are now guiding these patients mm -hmm. through this process because the doctors don't even know how to do this. You know, and we're just a bunch of housewives or working moms who are, you know, we're just trying to live our lives, but we're out here trying to advocate and save each other because we're all we have, yep. you know. Um, I know we're gonna talk about going to the FDA and- Yeah, that's what I wanted to do because you, your mission was to get there. Yes, right? and yes. you and got we there. Did. <laughs> we have a picture of you uh, actually speaking. Yes. Right? Were you called on randomly? So I was. Um, there I you applied. Are. <laughs> there I am. I applied to speak, and I was told that I was going to be able to. But then we had such a great response that I basically didn't get the confirmation to speak. So I reached out to some of the girls, and they were like, "You know what? We called the gentleman, and he said that there's too many women, so there's no more room." Well, I was sitting in the audience and I was, you know, actually playing on my phone for a moment and all of a sudden they call my name and I said, I'll be right there. And I grabbed my things and I hadn't practiced my speech or anything. So I was so nervous going up there, but I spoke with my heart. And, you know, one of the things that we had to listen to for those full two days was people who were saying that, you know, we get our facts from the Internet and we get our facts from social media. And I barked back at the end of my speech and I said, sometimes social media is the only place that we have to turn. And it's the truth. Because if the FDA and Big Pharma and the medical community are gonna let us down, mm -hmm. we have to be our own advocates. Yeah. So, um, so I barked back. I think I got yelled at, you can hear him say something during my speech. I think he was yelling at me for yelling because I was yelling into the microphone, but I just felt so, so passionate. <laughs> so um, yeah, he didn't turn the microphone off, so that was good. So was there an ask there? Or was, or was it just you voicing what's it going was, on? It was, so there was there several different things that happened. I mean, the FDA spoke, and I use the term spoke loosely because they got beat up. They didn't have answers for that panel at all. They sat there with their head in their hands like, well, okay, who's doing these tests? Well, guess what? The manufacturers are doing the tests. Of course the manufacturers are going to say, yeah, these are safe. They're totally safe. That would be like cigarette companies We're telling you that tobacco is safe, right? So, you know, the FDA has totally dropped the ball, and they sent these two representatives that had no answers. It was... It was a crazy experience, but it was, it was... Was this a panel that the FDA convened to talk about this yeah, issue? Yeah, the panel was made up of several doctors, right. and I, I don't even know all of but the... But it was sponsored by or run by the FDA? Yes. So yep. fact, was it the idea to be fact-finding? Yes, okay. they wanted to, um, to fact-find, and they wanted to hear what we were asking for, and basically, you know, what we were asking for. Because last time I spoke with Krista, we were at the point where a bunch of women had gone to the FDA and asked for an open hearing, right. and we got it. Yeah. And so that's what happened that's in March. And they listened to us, and we had several doctors speak on our behalf, which was wonderful. Um, Dr. Clemens from MD Anderson, and then there was another man, I forget his name right now, but he was amazing, and he talked about the autoimmune response caused by implants, and he was an amazing man. We all wanted to just jump up and kiss him because <laughs> he spoke on our behalf, and he says, we've known this for years. And he ended by saying, you know, you've recently had 
two airplanes that have come down. And, you know, they're faulty. There is something faulty about them. So you took them down. You took them out of the air. Yeah, the, the entire How many fleet. women yeah. have to die or suffer before you do something about this? And we all stood up and, you know, basically just cheered and cried mm -hmm. because it was, you know, that's what we need them to hear. And he's got the credential. I mean, he's Absolutely. the doctor, right? Yes. So he's like, a, he's like a, not even just a doctor. He's like several doctors of several things and Where is just a very here? smart man. Oh my gosh, I cannot remember his name and oh. I feel so so bad. That's all right. That's all I right. Feel so bad. Um, That's okay. We love him. I don't remember. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> but he was great. So, um, so the FDA thing was just an amazing experience. I met. You know, I've been in this support group now for you know um, almost two years, and I feel like I know these women. Mm -hmm. So that what was really special to me was to be able to put faces to. What's your support network? Absolutely. You know, we we um, help each other. We pray for each other. We cry with each other, and. It's just been such an amazing experience. So um, I got to meet Nicole, who started the group, and um, she hugged me and told me how little I was. And <laughs> she's like, "You're so tiny." So um, I just, I just adore them, and um, and so it was just really great to meet them. And we're such a community and a sisterhood. So um, it was just a great experience so to Tara, be there. Tara, let me ask you're changing the world. You're yeah, changing the obviously. world. Obviously, and, and let me ask you, what's next? What's the next thing to happen? If there are people who are watching us, obviously you, you want to give out information, but what's the next step? Where does it go from here? So, gosh, I feel like there's so many things in the works, and to speak about everything would be hard because I can't remember them while I'm doing this. But um, right it's now, okay. most most currently, there's we have two ladies representing us, and they're looking at the um, Medical Device Safety Act. So sure. they're looking to pass an act for all medical devices because now you remember there's also the eShore that's been in the news. Now that's the implantable birth control device that has been taken off of the market because women are having to have full hysterectomies and they are not able to have children and there are a lot of responses that women my, are getting. My dumb question would be which of the new women members of Congress mm -hmm. have you approached? So me personally, none, but there are women who are, you know, trying to work within their state and I've inquired on how to do that. I haven't taken steps to do that in our state yet, but it's something that's on my list of things to do. And, you know, just really getting them on board and saying, hey, you need to help us support this act right. and you need to, you know, um, to go back to your people and say, we need to do this. We need to do this. We need to pr protect these women and we need to let them know that this is important and we can no longer be guinea pigs. So. You uh, feel so passionate about this that you wrote a story. I did. Right. And that says, when did that come out, your book? I have a picture I, of your book cover, by the way. Let's put that up there. I released there it, it. Oh, there it is. I released it in January. I believe it was January 29th was the big day, the big reveal. I actually had written most of it when I was here talking to you last time. And I just sat on it for quite a while. Um, I never expected it to be a book. I really just wanted to document my story and mostly for my girls, yeah. you know, because they've walked through this with me right. and my husband. and. It's been such a life-changing experience for me, and it's given me such a greater appreciation for my body and my life and my health that I just wanted them to know what I learned so that they don't make the same mistakes. Mm -hmm. So I sat at my computer and I wrote my story. And then I let my mom read my story, and she said, this is pretty good, you know? Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, you think anybody else would want to read it? <laughs> so she said, maybe, you know? I definitely think some people would want to read it. So. I looked at Amazon and I self-published my book. I did everything myself except for the cover. I owe that to a lovely lady in Canada. I love that. Thank you. Oh, that is such a picture of like, it just says everything. Yeah, I had the design, I knew what I wanted. Um, and my dear friend took the picture for me, Courtney, and she, and it was just um, it was a great it was a great experience. And so I have the cover now and, and the book has gotten an amazing response. You know, my story is the same as everybody else's story right. out there, you know? And but my, not everybody can tell it. Not everybody can tell it, and I guess not everybody wants to put themselves out yeah. there. I've, that's just been something I've always been good at, so, um, so I don't mind. And, and um, I just really, I wanted to help people feel not alone. That was my main mission in going ahead and publishing it. And I think I've accomplished that, mm -hmm. which is really nice to be able to say. Right. I've had women reach out to me and, you know, tell me that, you know, your story is my story. And so my new quote is, we are all pieces of the same story. 
and we really are. Um, we all have very many of the same symptoms, very many of the same, um, you know, life-changing events that happen. You know, this is a very, a lot of times for women, it's a very faith-driven experience mm -hmm. because you're at your knees, right? You're on your knees praying to God, please give me a sign, tell me what's wrong. And then you find Nicole's website and you go, thank you, God. And so for me, I talk about how, what a faithful experience it was for me. And um, so there's a lot in the book and I end with just talking about, you know, I'm kind of having a love affair with myself now. Mm, like I yeah. just really- so my, and my question is, how are you now? I'm great. Okay. I'm really great. Um, I'm a better version of my old self, I like to say. And by that, I mean that, you know, I just, I used to pass by a mirror like every other woman and make, you know, make comments about, I didn't like this and I didn't like that. And that was too big and that was not big enough. So I don't do that anymore. And I know that my beauty comes from within mm -hmm. and I want every other woman to feel that way. And I don't want anybody to feel pressured by society to look a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and recently I had a, a friend you know, talk about how even, even women who've had to suffer through a mastectomy, you know, these doctors, they talk about reconstruction and how they need to rebuild themselves. Well, you know, in all honesty, you're still a woman without your breasts yeah. and women need to know that they have other options mm -hmm. and that it's not just breasts that are going to make you whole or make you feel like a woman, you know, sexy and confident comes from inside. Mm -hmm. And these are the things that I've learned. So I am feeling great. I would say that 90% of my symptoms are gone. I still have a few swollen lymph nodes. Sometimes my ears still ring. And, um, you know, sometimes I have days where I feel really that chronic fatigue set back mm -hmm. in and I get a little anxious just because I'm afraid that things are going to come back. But typically, we move forward the next day, and I feel good. I had one of those days over the weekend, and I got a little sad, you know, just because I never want to feel that way again. Yeah. Right. Um, but I'm doing great. That's good. Great. Is there anything, we have to wrap, but is there anything else that we missed that you want to make? Yeah, she needs to, to, to tell people how they sure can reach out have. to her or get more information. Or so, yeah, groups. I mean, I'm on Facebook as uh, Tara Hopko, and... Um, I'm on Instagram as tiny underscore tower. So that's my Instagram name. And you can get my book on Amazon. It's in paperback and it's on Kindle. And it just came out in audiobook too, which is great. And I've had people buy the book in, I think, Italy and Denmark and the UK. That's and great. so I'm just grateful because I'm just grateful. It's that one more person, right? Yeah. yeah. Each person that you and help. And the website that you said Nicole started? Yeah, so um, I believe there's a picture that we could put up with the yes, website we for, um, it's healingbreastimplantillness.com, and we have a Facebook support group of over 76,000 women now, so that's Breast Implant Illness and Healing by Nicole, and you can join, it's a private group, so anything that you say there is kept private if you don't want people to know what you're suffering, and just be educated, be your own advocate, be educated, and if you don't have implants and you're considering them, don't do it and love yourself for who you are because your breasts don't make you who you are. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I just really appreciate you letting me have a voice here. I want to add one thing because I had a, a neighbor that recently uh, had breast cancer and I was, when I found out, and it was like the next day she was going to get the surgery, and I texted you because yeah. I just found out, I said, no, I have to go, like, I have to go and talk to her because she lives down the street. But I told you that she was choosing to use uh, her own fat. Fat. Yeah, so she was having a fat transfer. And that's an option for people, right? It is an option. And I don't know how much research is done on the long-term effects of that. I don't, okay. I've never looked into it. But um, that is an option for women. And I know, I do know, I actually work with a woman who had it done, and she's had great results. It's not a foreign object. It's not I mean, a foreign it's object. It's in you, so that's an option. Correct. It is your own tissue and your yeah. own fat. And sometimes I think it, it absorbs within your body. So they say sometimes you have to have, have the surgery a couple times right, before right. it, you know, sticks. But a better alternative. But a better sure. alternative than a Seems foreign like object. It, Absolutely. Right, close us out. Uh, yeah. I, I, thank you so much. Thank I mean, this you. is obviously, I'm not of the correct gender, <laughs> but uh, I think this is was a very important story when, when and Kristen it's who told you know. me. That. I mean, it you is, know women, so I think it's important for men to hear too. I've had a it lot is. of husbands read my it book and actually is. reach out to me and say it gives me a greater perspective on how much pressure women actually put on themselves. Yeah. You know, and I think so. I think it's important for men to hear because you know. I'm not being mean, but men add to that pressure sometimes. <laughs> True. So, <laughs> can we um, give your husband a shout out? <laughs> oh, my <laughs> husband. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, yes, my husband's been very supportive, and he has been. He's um, one of the good guys. Yes, he's one of the good Thanks guys. So I am very thankful. My whole family has been, you know, just amazing. And all of my doctors that I've reached out to, you know, my primary care doctor, he was the first one to believe me. So, um, you know, I have been surrounded by m much support, but there's not everybody, yeah. not everybody has. Yeah. And I think that that's a huge reason why I'm speaking out is because I feel like I'm one of the blessed ones. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to use my voice because I do have. I got like a whole troop of people behind yeah. me going, yeah. you can do this. Well, that's great. So. Again, thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you. Uh, again, Mitch Brooks, Krista Smolda, this is RVN TV. This is Morning Coffee, one every day from 8 to 9. I'm here on Tuesdays. Krista is here as well. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you. Have a great week. By the Website, book, book. By the book. important <laughs> subject. Thanks. Have a great thank day. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome.